But uh, I'm really thankful that you guys are here. I'm thankful that I get to be your pastor, and uh, I'm thankful uh, for the goodness of God that has been shown faithful in my life. And uh, for all of my days, I'm going to sing of his praise and his goodness, and I would encourage uh, all of us to do that. Uh, That's what a living testimony is, is saying God is good, and when I'm not, God is good. And so uh, he's good. Amen? Amen. Hey, we are continuing in our series uh, in the book of Genesis, so turn to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be looking at the life of Noah, and uh, I just, as you turn there, I just want to make a plug for tonight. There's a sermon being preached uh, titled, How Could a Loving God Flood the Earth? It's a great question. In fact, I've had many conversations with people as I've reached out or I'm trying to witness to someone, and this is a big question for a lot of uh, people. Uh, I think this is a big question for Christians, but non-believers as well. And so if you don't know how to answer that question, or you don't know the answer to that question, you should come back tonight. And if you're a family, uh, you got young kids, we've got services for the kids. We've got the early childhood department rolling. We've got the elementary that happens. And uh, elementary, you, you check your kids in, but then you worship here. And then after worship, we send them in there. And so they've got uh, a different lesson. And so there's something for the whole family. So come back tonight. And before we look at Genesis 6 here, I just want to say thank you to everyone who helped out with Operation Christmas Child. Um, we had uh, nearly a 1,000 shoe boxes from New Hope alone. And so thank you guys for uh, filling those boxes and bringing those. But a special thanks to Troy and Missy Clark and so many other people, Mike and, and Pat. And there's been a lot of people that have put in tons and tons of time. And so can we just uh, show some appreciation for Operation Christmas Child. Thank you so much. And the other thing, this past week uh, through Tori Bagley, Tori, thank you for taking initiative in um, packaging, um, and many people have brought food uh, to package for, for families in need during the holidays. And there was over 100, maybe 130 or so baskets that were delivered to different people, single parents, uh, immigrant families, anybody who might be down and out that could use a blessing. And there was a ton of people, many of you brought canned goods. You guys are a great church, and you guys are a generous church, and I'm thankful that, that you're a part. And one other way that we can be generous, I don't think it was announced but uh, we have an opportunity right now on the table with a $100,000 match from professional athletes and businessmen around the world to, to do water wells. I was in Tanzania this past February, and I got to see the thankfulness in the hearts and the eyes of people that are, their lives have literally been changed because of clean water. And so would you do this? I'm not going to say everybody give. I'm going to say this. Would you actually go before the Lord in prayer? and ask him, how do you want me to participate in this? Because it's easy just to say, yeah, I can throw some money at that, but maybe God would be asking you to do something and stepping out in obedience. Uh, And so would you just go before the Lord, if you're married, get with your your spouse and, and begin to pray, God, how can our family, how can my family, how can we support bringing clean water And planting these wells by churches so that people might experience the true living water of Jesus Christ. Would you do that? Church, you're amazing. Genesis chapter 6, talking about Noah, his faithfulness, his obedience. And we're going to start in verse 9. It says this, you can follow along. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch, which is like tar, inside and out. And this is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. In other words, it's going to be huge, okay? It's a huge ship that did not land. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all around. But a door in the side of the ark and make Uh, But make a, excuse me, put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. 
Verse 17, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come with you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Chapter 7, the Lord Then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word that is true, that is alive, and I pray this morning that our hearts would be turned towards you, that you would awaken in us uh, just the realization that you are speaking, that you are inviting us, and so God, I pray for those who are are not walking with you, that are living in disobedience. I pray that this morning our hearts would be turned back to you and that we would run to your arms, God. We, we love you. We thank you for this word. Speak through me in this service what you want. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. So Noah was this incredible man who walked faithfully with the Lord. And that's my desire for everyone here, everyone watching online. It's my desire that we all walk faithfully with the Lord. Not that you would just attend church, but that you would walk with God. And at the end of my sermon, I'm going to ask people to look inward and allow Holy Spirit, the person Holy Spirit, to speak and nudge at your heart and, and, and reveal any areas in your life that might need some adjusting, that might need some reprioritizing. Because the closer you walk with God, the better you're going to hear his voice. And the easier it will be to obey him. And I I pray this morning that you would spend time in the word so that when God speaks to you, that you would be able to recognize that it's his voice. And that you wouldn't have to wonder, is this the Lord leading me or is this not? Because as we walk faithfully with the Lord, as we walk closely with the Lord, obedience becomes easy. His voice becomes recognizable. And that's my desire that we would all live like Noah did, righteous and blameless, walking faithfully with the Lord. Now some of you right now already know that this message is for you because you know in your heart that you're not faithfully walking with the Lord. Now I've got good news because God is not standing up in heaven with a paddle and a belt waiting for you. He's standing with a ring and a robe, with loving arms, and he's inviting you in to be in an intimate relationship with him, a relationship that is empowering, that is full of life, that is full of joy. And so today, if you feel in your heart that today you are not closer with God than you have been at any other point in your life, last week, last month, yesteryear, whenever it was, this message is for you, and I want you to be ready to respond. I want you to respond and step into faithfully walking with God. Let's get started. The first thing to notice is that Noah obeyed God even when it didn't make sense. Flip back to Genesis chapter two. Anybody ever had God ask them to do uh, something that just completely did not make sense? Okay, no, only me. Sounds good. Um, Genesis chapter two, verse five and six says this. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. But streams 
came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And then jumping down to verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters. Now, many scholars believe that up until the time of Noah that it hadn't rained on the earth, that the way the ground received moisture and rain was, was through either a mist or through um, these streams that came up from the earth. Okay? Can you imagine trying to obey God if you're Noah? And he calls you to build this giant boat. I would have so many questions. I'd be like, what's rain? Why, why, why God? What, what are, what, what is, why are you flooding the earth? What is a flood? What is this destruction? I can only imagine how God's instructions to Noah just made absolutely no sense to him. Now, I'm a person who likes to ask why. Any other why askers in the room, right? If I ask the question why, it's not because I disagree. It's not necessarily because I'm trying to be defiant. The reason why I like to know the reason to why is it helps me follow through with what's being asked of me. Anybody else like that? I have found in parenting, parenting tip 101 today, okay, this is free. I found that if I give the reason why behind I want my kids to eat vegetables, that my kids do a better job at eating vegetables. And my four-year-old knows when she's eaten too much sugar or had too many carbs, and she's like, we need some greens in us because greens are good for us. You know, there's a reason why, there's a reason why, and she doesn't always say that. She's also like, we need some sugar in us because I'm, t-, you know, she's, she's crazy. She's the hot dog girl, okay? Um, but giving the reason why often helps my children obey better. But it doesn't say in Scripture that God gave Noah the reason why. For, you know, it says, I'm going to bring destruction, but what is this? Why? There's confusion that's going on. We see in the New Testament that it was by faith that Noah built the ark. The, the Hebrews author in 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen. What are the things not yet seen? Maybe rain? flooding, mass destruction, you know, like a complete 40 days and 40 nights. You guys remember back in, it was probably 2019, 2020, when we had that five-inch rain in like a matter of like three hours? Can you imagine that type of rain for 40 days and 40 nights? That would be nuts. That's crazy. So when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Even though Noah didn't fully understand why God was telling him to start this massive, hundred plus year long project, he obeyed. He obeyed. The Greek word for faith is pistis. I've, I've taught this before, P-I-S-T-I-S. And it literally translates this, trusting obedience. It, it, it means that I trust in God, and therefore I obey God. Noah had pistis. Noah had faith. Noah trusted God. He believed in God's heart so much that even when it didn't make sense, he spent over a hundred years constructing an ark. Can you imagine building a boat by hand, possibly before iron, out of cypress wood that's over 500 feet long, and 75 feet wide, and 50 feet high, and then painting that with tar and all of these different things. Can you imagine how difficult that would have been for Noah to obey? I would be asking why every day. I'd be like, why God? Why have you done this, God? You know, and I would just be asking why, but he obeyed. Man, there have been several times in my life where God tells me to do something that doesn't make sense, and it takes faith. You know what true faith is? True faith is trust in God that leads to obedience. That's true faith. I want to ask you, church, I want to ask you 830, blended service, online, do you have this type of faith? Is this the type of faith that is evident in your life? That you trust and believe in the heart of God. That when he tells you something in his word that you obey. Is that the type of faith that you have? Or do you always like, oh, I don't know, that's, that's kind of Old Testament-ish-y. 
That's a little bit religious. I don't know about that. Is this your faith, that you trust God's heart? God knows what's best for you because he's the one who created you. He fearfully and and wonderfully knit you in your mother's womb. Are you questioning what God is asking of you or are you trusting in his heart and saying, I'm going to obey? Man, there's been so many times where God has asked me to do things that just don't make sense, okay? Um, There's been times where I'm headed home from work and I live in Grimes. I can go down Meredith, I can go down 141, I can go down the interstate. And there's times where it's like, don't go down the interstate today. Don't go down 141 today. Go down Meredith today. Take the long way today. And there's times where I just have to obey. There's been times where he's asked me to speak to someone or he's asked me to call someone or he lays someone on my heart and I just begin to send that text. And sometimes I don't ever see the result of trying to obey God. Anybody ever done that where God's asked you to do something that's a little bit weird and you're just like, what was the purpose of that besides just to make me look like a doofus, right? Not that I need help in that, Lord, but, you know, what was the purpose in that? There's many times where we'll never know what our obedience accomplishes here on earth. Are you okay with that or do you always need a reward? Do you always need that, that confirmation? But on the other hand, there have been times where the Lord has asked me to do things that make complete and total nonsense in, in my mind, in my way of thinking, where I do see instant um, you know, reasoning behind it. There's been times where I've called people or I felt really impressed in my heart to send that text and they're like, man, how do you know? It's just every time you text, every time you call me, it's just like you know that I need that. God knew and i just like, God is helping me. Are you living obedient? Are you allowing the spirit of God? Are you walking faithfully with the Lord so that you might recognize those voices? Last year, yesterday, okay, a year ago yesterday, I shot the biggest deer that I've ever killed in my entire life. And here's a picture of him in my office. He's a big one. And uh, yeah, you can go, everybody go, ooh, one, two, three. Ooh, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, some of you are like, I really don't care. Is that big? Is that a doe? (laughs) You know, like, no, that's a big deer. Um, And I I was with my best friend, Jared Atchison. I've known Jared every day of my life. And we went to this double tree stand, meaning two people can sit in the tree stand at once. And we don't have to sit on each other's laps, okay? That'd be weird. We're sitting beside each other. And uh, it was a perfect evening. We crawled in the stand about three o'clock that day. And uh, we didn't see anything. And it was about 4.40, which is just about before it's kind of getting too late to to draw back and and see and stuff. And you had about another half hour of light or so. And I felt like the Lord told me to get out my deer call and do a snort wheeze. Now, some of you guys are like, what's a snort wheeze? Okay, a snort wheeze for a buck is a sign of dominance. When you do a snort wheeze, it's saying, I'm the big dog on campus, get out of my way, those are my does, I'm going to breed them. And the only time that you would really apply this, typically, is if you're seeing that dominant buck and he's hanging up out, you know, 100 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards, and you can't get him to come in for whatever reason. And I felt like the Lord speaking to me specifically and he said Austin get out your snort wheeze and I turned to Jared and I said this sounds super crazy and you can ask him this is 100% factual okay you can ask Jared I said Jared I feel like the Lord is wanting me to do a snort wheeze what do you think and he goes well we can't do much worse we haven't seen anything else (laughs) person of faith right there okay (laughs) and uh, so I get in my backpack I make all this commotion I get it out and I go I put it away and I'm like, well, that's dumb. I probably won't, you know, I probably just scared all the does that were potentially gonna come and, you know, just whatever. And we're sitting there for about three minutes and then I feel the Lord tell me, as clear as day, Austin, get up, get your bow and turn around. There's gonna be a deer that comes diagonally from behind you. And so I stand up and I say, Jared, I don't know why, but I feel like there's gonna be a deer that comes diagonally from behind us. And so I'm sitting on the left side of the tree stand. Jared's sitting on the right side of the tree stand. And I get up, I grab my bow, and I start looking this way. And it wasn't more than 30 seconds, maybe a minute tops. And diagonally off of Jared's back right shoulder, in comes this buck. And I see him, I say, Jared, you're a shooter. And he steps a little bit closer. And I had seen this deer eight days prior. And I said, it's the same deer. And I take out my inhaler. 
No, I didn't do that. I don't, I don't have asthma. But that's about what it was like, okay? And, and I just began to zone in. He comes in. I shoot him, and he crashes, and it was just this incredible thing, okay? Why do I tell this story, okay? It's a silly deer. I don't get to take this deer with me to heaven. In fact, when I held that deer in my hands, this is, this is a 199 and 3 eighths inch deer, okay? He had massive mass. It's like a 200 inch. This is like the pinnacle. This would be like hitting the lottery, winning the World Series type of, of deer. And I remember holding that deer and thinking, this is it. But this is nothing like being in the presence of Jesus. This is nothing like spending time with my family, This is nothing like being in that rich moment where the presence of God comes around you and all else fades and passes away and there's just this warmth and there's this embrace. And I remember thinking, what am I chasing? What am I chasing? Something that's gonna look pretty in my office, if you wanna see, I'll show you, okay? But if, if something that looks pretty in my office that's just gonna get thrown away someday, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, There's something so much richer about walking faithfully with the Lord and being in his presence where when he speaks, you can respond. But I can tell you this, obedience leads to rewards. And I believe this. I believe that you'll be rewarded here on earth, but more importantly in heaven. More importantly in heaven. And and how I want to be rewarded when I get up to heaven and hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done, Austin. Are you walking closely with the Lord so that you can obey even when it doesn't make logical sense? Maybe God is is asking you to do something that goes against logic and reasoning in your mind and your heart, to take that pay cut, to have that demotion maybe so that it's less money and you might have to sell the house but you get to spend more time with your kids because you only get one opportunity to be a dad. Maybe God is asking you to do something that that doesn't make sense financially where it's like, man, begin to tithe. I want you to tithe. I want you to honor me but the budget doesn't line up but God's asking you to do it even though it doesn't make sense. Maybe God is asking you to do something like talk to a stranger or, or, or telling you to move or, or whatever it might be. Are you walking faithfully with the Lord that he might speak to you, that he might strengthen you and empower you so that you can obey like Noah did when it didn't make sense? Is that the type of faith that you have this morning? The second thing that we notice is that Noah obeyed when no one else was. Believe it or not, Noah lived in a more ungodly society than we're living in today. Take a look at Genesis chapter six, verse five. It says that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. In verses 11 and 12 of chapter 6, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Have you ever wondered how society grew so wicked and, and so perverse and so violent in that day and age? Could it, could it be that man began to compare themselves to each other rather than the holiness of God? Could it be that man began to prefer the fellowship with other men more than the fellowship with God? How is there so much sin in the church today? How is there so much sin in New Hope today, in Urbandale, in Johnson, and in the churches? I'm talking the church as a whole. Could it be that we have begin to compare our holiness to other people's unholiness rather than to the holiness of God. The things that I've seen people post, the leaders post, even pastors post on social media sometimes have been nothing less than disheartening. And I'm not trying to throw stones because there go I but the grace of God. I'm a sinner in need of grace, but there is a difference between fighting the flesh and celebrating the flesh. I get it, it's hard to live righteous and blameless in a culture that is everything but that. I get that, but there are people who have and can do that. You can live righteous and blameless in today's culture. Noah did. We look at scripture and it says that he was righteous, that he was blameless. 
He obeyed God while the world rebelled. And he obeyed God when everyone else wasn't. How? It goes back to faithfully walking with God. Knowing his voice, walking closely, abiding with him. What does it look like to walk faithfully with the Lord? It takes some spiritual disciplines. Things such as as praying. When is the last time you just carved out 15 or 20 minutes to silence your phone, silence the notifications, get in your car, go to the bathroom and lock the doors, whatever you have to do, just to hear God's voice and begin to commune and communicate with God. Praying, fasting. When was the last time that you actually fasted? We talk about it being a discipline. Things such as actually reading the word of God. Things like making church a priority, not because going to church saves you, but because going to church is a part of a person's spiritual development where iron sharpens iron, where it begins to shape you and form you and and, and mold you into the person that God wants you to be. I would not be the pastor that I am to be without many of you. As I look into your eyes and I look into your faces, without many of you shaping me into the person that I'm supposed to be. And let me tell you, I have not arrived. I come every week and I need people to speak to me, to say that wasn't right, to shape me and form me. These are the types of things that involve walking faithfully with the Lord. Sometimes the reason why people are struggling with, with their Christian walk and walking faithfully with the God is because they spend more time with ungodly friends than they do godly friends. Now, now I'm not saying, don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is that we should just isolate ourselves and that we should just dump all of our non-Christian friends and we should be um, you know, just completely isolated from that. In fact, the, the scriptures speak against that where Paul says to be in the world but not of the world. But I believe that there's some people here this morning that struggle because you prefer fellowship with the ungodly more than the godly. You prefer fellowship with man more than fellowship with God. Now I realize that there are many of you here this morning that probably live a pretty holy life in the sense that you don't cuss, you don't chew, you don't go with girls that do, right? But I, one thing that I've learned throughout my life is that when I am doing well and not sinning, Satan will just attack me in a different way. If Satan can't get me to sin, he'll just distract me and make me busy. He'll just make me busy. Are you walking with God or are you consumed with the things that you want to do? Are you consumed with the pleasures of this world? Are you consumed with your kids? Grandparents, are you consumed with your grandchildren? Where you spend more time thinking about how to bless them rather than how to bless God? What if we got to the point where we pour out our jars of incense and oils, which is like saying, I'm giving you my life, and we just sat at the feet of Jesus, and we just began to pour it on him, and we began to care more about blessing God than we did the people that we're involved with. You know what happens when we bless God and we sit at his feet? You become just this walking, blessing person. As you walk, you just begin to shoot out blessings. As people walk by, they smell the aroma of God and they are blessed. Do you prioritize your time with God in the mornings, in the noon times, in the evenings? Are you committed to attending church where iron sharpens iron? Do you fast? Do you study? Studying the word of God, going to Sunday school, getting in a class. Spiritual disciplines, hear me. Spiritual disciplines it, it, it are not meant to make your life more busy and more difficult. They are meant to help you walk faithfully with God. The last thing that I want you to hear this morning is that this is a moralistic sermon because it's all about Jesus. Doing this apart from Jesus is not going to be possible and it's religion and it's going to be extremely exhausting and overwhelming. You guys hear what I'm saying? This is not just try harder, obey, rah, rah, rah. This is step close and walk in with God, our Father, who will help you. Teenager, it's possible to obey God in the midst of an ungodly school setting. Worker, it's possible to obey God and honor God in the midst of an ungodly work environment. 
It's possible, but it involves abiding with Christ, walking faithfully with him. Noah obeyed when it didn't make sense, when no one else was, and Noah obeyed to the fullest extent. God is calling the true church to take a stand and to obey him and take him at his word. Trust and obey, for there's no other way, right? Have you ever thought about that? Like, there's no other way but to trust and obey in Jesus. God is calling us to stand. Look at, look at what Noah does and how he lives. Verse uh, 22, chapter 6. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And again, in chapter 7, verse 5, and Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. You know, I'm sure that Noah was asking questions in those hundred plus years of building the ark. I'm sure that Noah had people calling him crazy saying, are you kidding me? You're doing what? You're doing what with your 401k? You're doing what with your house? You're doing what in your older age? You're doing what in this and you're doing what? You're crazy, Noah. I'm sure he had all the reasons to give up, to have self-doubt, to question why he's doing this. God, you said it was going to rain. It hadn't even had a cloud. What's a cloud? But Noah obeyed to the fullest extent. And sometimes people don't obey to the fullest extent because of their fear of failure. I'm not qualified, or I'm not a great speaker. I don't know what they'll question you know, me, and I don't know if I'll have the answers. I don't have the resources. I'm too tired. All right, how about this one? I've already put my time in, I've already served. What if it doesn't work out? What if I look silly? What if I look dumb? Can I just remind you this morning, New Hope, that the pain of falling short is far less than the shame of stopping short. Don't let an insecurity get in the way of your obedience. If God is asking you to do something this morning, do it, and do it with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Why? Because God is gonna be with you. If you're faithfully walking with him and he asks you to do it, he's gonna help you do it. There's never been a time where I've told Sam to do something that I know he couldn't do if I'm right there. Sam, could you lift this snowblower up into this truck? Could, could you do this to the back of my tailgate for me, buddy? And I'm standing right there, and I'm just going to stand and watch him struggle lifting a snowblower. You know what I'm going to do as a father? I'm going to say, come on, Sam, you get the other side. I got this side. And I'm going to take the majority of the weight and set it in the back of my truck, and he's going to feel accomplished as a young kid. Did you know that God might be asking asking you to do something and out of your fear of failing because you're looking at the snowblower, you're looking at that thing saying, I, there's no way I can lift it. There's no way I can do it. And he's saying, I don't want you to do it. I want to help you do it. God will empower you. God will fill you. He will equip you. The main reason why Jesus leaves is so that he sends the power of the Holy Spirit that not just is a part in this church, not just in a temple or in a tent, but that lives inside you. Don't let your insecurities prevent you from, from being completely obedient to the fullest extent, but it's also important to remember this morning that partial obedience is still disobedience. It's ultimately rebellion against God and sin, which separates us from him. Are there things, ask yourself, allow this to really soak into your bones. Are there things in your life that are only partially surrendered to Christ? Things such as tithing, things such as forgiving your enemy or your spouse or your parent. Things such as witnessing where you felt a long time I need to go next door and introduce myself to that person because they need Jesus. Are there things that are partially surrendered? Have you submitted to God's authority and fully stepped into the blessing? Yes, the blessing of obedience. You know what also follows obedience? Not just blessings, but joy. True joy. It feels so good to obey my heavenly father and have him say, Austin, I'm proud of you. Well done. You are my son with whom I'm well pleased. He says that. You are my daughter with whom I'm well pleased. 
Are you obeying God to the fullest extent? See, Noah obeyed when it didn't make sense, when no one else was, and to the fullest extent. But the final thing I want you to see this morning is that Noah's life points to Christ's. Jesus lived a righteous and a blameless life. Jesus walked faithfully with God the Father. Jesus obeyed when it might not have made sense. Can you imagine Jesus thinking, God, do you really want me to take some dirt and spit in it and rub it on this guy's eyes? You really want me to spit on this person? You really want me to do this? Jesus obeyed when the culture wasn't. When even the religious leaders were failing, the ones that were supposed to be set apart, Jesus obeyed faithfully. But most importantly, Jesus obeyed to the fullest extent by giving up his life as a sin offering, a sacrifice, to pay for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be in heaven forever. Even though it might have not made total sense, even though it wasn't easy, in fact, it shows that it wasn't easy because in the garden, Matthew chapter 26 or 27, what does he say? God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will be done. And as a result of both Noah's and Jesus's obedience, the world was saved. Noah saved the world physically while Jesus brought it to completion and he saves the world spiritually, eternally, forever and ever. The only way to obey like Noah and Jesus is to walk faithfully with God, spending time reading the word of God so that you can identify those words, slowing down. This is practical, slowing down and asking God, is there anything in my heart that I need to repent of? Is there anything in my ways that is offensive to you? Is there anything, God, that I have said, that I have done in the way that I have treated your creation today? Is there anything? Are you doing that? When you wake up in the morning, are you inviting the Holy Spirit of God to set your feet on a path of righteousness? The preparation of the gospel of peace, putting on those shoes. One area that I've felt convicted in lately, the last couple months, is in fasting on a regular basis. You know, some of the most clear times that I've heard the Lord speak to me is when I'm the hungriest physically. That's what I feel like. I feel like the Lord is calling me to fast more regular, more where I get hungry, where I get hungry, where every time my stomach growls and grumbles, I'm saying, God, replace that with a desire to walk faithfully and closely with you. Fill me with more of your spirit. You're the one who sustains me. You're the one who gives me. I'm inconveniencing my life that I might redirect my mind and my attention and my heart to things that really matter, that are eternal, that are forever. If you're not currently walking with the Lord this morning, there's an open invitation with your name on it. An invitation to receive forgiveness, an invitation to receive mercy and grace like you have never experienced before. That guilt and that shame and the stain of sin that feels like it's just going to be carried with you forever, it can be wiped away, be brought, made as white as snow through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And there's an invitation for you to step into a father that has loving arms, that wants to help you. He wants to help you in whatever he calls you to. And in just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to ask God to forgive you, to enter your heart. If you've never asked him to be Lord of your life, you're going to have an opportunity. Do you put away your notes? We're not going to sing this morning. I didn't feel like singing was the appropriate response. Rather, we're going to allow Holy Spirit to do what he does best. And what he does 
is he will speak to us, he will convict us, and he will guide us. So put away all distractions. I'm just going to ask that, that you get in a posture that is ready to receive. Now, some of you, sitting is the best because your knees and your feet hurt. I understand that. Some of you, you might just have to stand and just be like, man, I just, I just need to stand to receive from the Lord. But we're going to take the next two minutes, and I've got some questions that I'm going to ask. And we're going to allow Holy Spirit to speak to us. So close your eyes and get in a, a posture ready to receive this morning. With every eye closed and head bowed, allow God to speak to you. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, speak to us, God. Reveal to us our inmost being, God. Is there an area in your life that is partially surrendered? Are you closer with God today than you were yesterday? Is your faith the kind of faith that you want your children to have? And if you were to die tonight, would you be confident that you'd be with Jesus? Let's just allow him to speak to us this morning. Help us, Father. with every eye closed and head bowed if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life you realize that you are not walking faithfully with him that you've never asked him to enter your heart to forgive you of your past sins and that you need him to change your way of thinking to change your heart's desires to set your feet on feet on a new path a new trajectory a trajectory towards heaven and eternity with Christ and if that's you this morning you say for the first time I'm asking God to enter my heart to be Lord of my life to walk with me to be beside me with every eye closed and head bowed would you just raise your hand and look at me this morning and I want to pray with you yeah Thank you, Jesus, for this hand. God, I pray that this morning you would save him, that you would place a peace in his heart, that he would know that, that you are with him, that you love him, that your grace is not fragile, that your mercy is not weak, but is overwhelming. It's like an ocean where there is no end and that you can just be lost in it. And so this morning, I pray that you would forgive him of all sins, that you would rid his mind of past mistakes and he would set his eyes on the future hope of heaven and on you Jesus and continue with eyes closed if you say this morning there are areas in my life that are partially surrendered would you just raise your hand I want to pray for you I want to pray that you would have a strength yes is there anyone else yes areas of partially surrender saying God I give it all to you today yes there are other people here that would just by a show of hands this morning would say, I need to get closer and draw closer to God this morning.
because yesterday I was closer. Last year I was closer. And you say, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to that heart of worship. You say, today I'm making it a priority. Would you raise your hand and say, I'm getting drawing closer. Yes, Jesus. I pray for every hand and every heart, old and young, male and female, God. I pray that they would just know what it is to walk in the presence of you, that more than anything, more than pecan pie, more than turkey and mashed potato leftovers, we would crave you, God, that we would crave your presence, that we would be a church that is so full of you that we wouldn't have to think about blessing other people. We wouldn't have to think about what is right or wrong in the situation because it would just flow from being with you. So God, I pray for every hand and every heart in this moment that this would be a time of dedication, of consecration, where we symbolically, God, just in our minds, in our hearts, just begin to get up, walk down, and lay on the altar saying, you can have all of me, all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my resources, all of my attention, Jesus. We're not going to be selfish. We're not going to hoard it, but we're going to pour it out on you. We're going to pour it out on you and trust that you will provide in the areas that we need provision. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Church, I'm really proud of you. I'm really thankful that I get to be your pastor. It's not easy uh, being a pastor, and I don't say that out of needing, like, sympathy, but it, it, it's, it's not. And uh, the greatest thing, honestly, if you can just hear my heart for a moment, the greatest thing that you could do to help your pastor, two things. First, pray for us pray for us. The second is to become a pastor yourself. I'm not talking about full-time vocational ministry, but what I'm talking about is you guys all have name tags. You've all got opportunities to be in Sunday school. And what's really beautiful and what's our heart's desire is when people begin to say, hey, I didn't see that person. You know who's a great pastor here? Junior Van Gorp. He just stepped out in the altar or out in the, the foyer. But he notices when people are gone. And he calls them and says, hey, I didn't see you last week. You noticed? You know, that, that's our heart's desire. That you, you guys would begin to, to love on each other and take notice of each other's needs and begin to, and you guys do a great job. So I'm not, I'm not rebuking you. I'm just challenging you and I'm releasing you. Don't look to all of us because if it's up to just us to pastor all of you, we're gonna fail. I will do my heart absolute hardest. I will try my hardest, but we're going to fail. So God bless you as you go, and may you walk closely with the Lord that you might hear his voice and obey like Noah did. We'll see you back tonight. How could a loving God flood the earth? Amen.